Well, welcome to Front Range. My name is Ernest Smith. I'm the lead pastor, and we're so grateful that you guys are here, whether you're joining us in person or maybe you're joining us online. We're grateful to have you, and uh, we say this every week. Our hope and prayer is that this become a home for you, a place where you can build community, discover your purpose, and grow in your faith in Jesus. I want to let you know about a couple things that are happening actually next Sunday, uh, and you can find out all this information on our events page on our website, uh, but let me give you uh, kind of two uh, quick things. One, we're having what's called a Parent Connect Night. Uh, so if you're a parent in our church and you want to connect with other parents, uh, we're also going to do a training on um, creating healthy boundaries around technology, uh, which I think is probably an important topic in today's world. My kids the other day were like, Dad, did you ever get on restrictions from technology? I'm like, we didn't have technology. Like, and a little junky Game Boy, you know, like we didn't have stuff. And in uh, and, and today's world, man, it's crazy. And you got to learn like how to have boundaries in your home and stuff like that. So we're going to be doing teaching on that. We'll have a, a, a parent panel a discussion as well. And um, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to fill up. So uh, go, you can either scan the QR code on the little card uh, that's um, uh, on your seats uh, or it's online right now. Or you can go to our website, go to our events page. Uh, also next week, we're going to do child dedications uh, we don't do baby baptisms. Uh, we do baptisms uh, when somebody has made a public declaration that they're following Jesus. We're actually doing that in two weeks. So if you're interested in that, you can check that box on your Connect card. Uh, but if you have a kid uh, that hasn't made that decision, but you want to dedicate them over to the Lord, then we're going to be doing that next Sunday. So love for you guys to be a part of that. Also, you can scan the QR code on your worship guide, or you can go to the um, Parent Connect tent uh, out as you're heading back toward your car, or go online at our events page, and you can get all the information there. Uh, now today, I I'm excited about um, uh, what we're going to be talking about. Have you ever read a book that transformed your thinking about a topic? Like think about a book, it, 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 some of you are like, I've never read, okay? If you've read books, uh, not the Bible, okay? You can't use the Bible as your, like, your, your, your book that you've read that transformed something. Have you ever read any other book besides the Bible that like transformed your thinking about a topic or an idea or something like that? Uh, I love to read, so I've got a lot of uh, options that, that I can think through, but one that stands out is, is this book called The Five Love Languages. Anybody ever read Five Love Languages? Okay, okay, a few of you have read it. Uh, the idea is this, is that uh, each person has what's called a love tank. Think like a, a gas tank in a car. And to fill up that love tank, uh, you, you've got to have certain language spoken to you that you receive that love. So it's kind of like in communication. If I speak English and you speak Swahili and we don't understand each other, then the communication is going to be kind of poor. Well, in love, you have to speak the language that that person receives. And this author says that there's five different types of love languages that you might receive. The first might be acts of service. Maybe you love people serving you, uh, you know, cleaning the house for you, getting your car washed, something like that. Uh, maybe that's you. Maybe yours is uh, quality time. You just love to like gaze at each other's eyes or what. I don't know what you do with quality time because uh, that's not my love language. Um, maybe it's physical touch. Maybe that's yours. I read this book when I was 19 and I'm like, yeah, that's definitely mine. <clears throat> then I realized it wasn't just smooching time. That one's not mine. Uh, the fourth one is words of affirmation. Uh, that one is mine. Words of affirmation is like you've got to be told how great you are all the time. Uh, so Sarah's constantly telling me how good looking I am, how strong I am. Basically, I'm Superman. It's exhausting for her. <laughs> exhausting. Uh, and the last one is gifts, which basically, that's Sarah's. And that basically means that I'm poor all the time uh, because that's how she receives love. And I remember reading this book and like processing through these five and thinking, how does God show us love? Like, how does God receive love, but how does God show you and I that he loves us, right? Because, I mean, God, can, can he give us gifts? Can he give us quality time? Can he give us words of affirmation? Like, all those things. How does God show us love? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to be continuing the series we started last week called The Road, A Journey Through Romans, uh, where we're looking at the book of Romans. And we gave a little bit of, of context to that last week, who wrote it, and all of that. If you missed that, you can go on our website. You can catch those messages. Here's what we've done. For every series, we've created a message series hub, okay? How you get there is you scan the QR code on your worship guide, or you go to our website, and you click on the tab messages, and you can get to message series hubs right there. On those hubs, there's all kinds of resources. There's something to read, something to watch, something to listen to. Uh, that way, we, we're catching all the ways of learning of people. You don't have to do all the things on there. There's a reading plan. There's all kinds of stuff that you can do, and we've created that just to give you a, a better understanding of God's Word. 
So many people have said, hey, we just want to grow in our knowledge of God. We want to grow in our, our understanding of who he is and what his word says and all that. So we've created these message series hubs. And as long as you guys are using them, we'll keep creating them uh, to, uh, to help resource you and uh, to help provide some, some growth in that area. Uh, the book of Romans, we've got a lot of resources on there for you. But I would say it's the best explanation of the gospel. Maybe you've heard that term before, the gospel. Uh, it simply means this. It's the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. It's like how you and I are all sinners and we're in need of a savior. Like that's the gospel message. And the book of Romans uh, is the best explanation of the gospel. It's 16 chapters, but out of those 16 chapters, there's five verses. Some people might take one verse out. Some people might add a couple verses, but there's five pretty standard verses that are called the Romans road. It's something that people have been using for almost 2000 years to lead people to faith and Jesus. So we're just walking through this road together. Last week we looked at Romans 3.23 that says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we talked about what that looks like and how that applies to our life. This week we're going to look at the, uh, the next stop on this road, and that's Romans 5.8. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. If not, no worries. It's going to be up on the screen. Uh, but to give you some context, i got to go a couple verses earlier. So we're going to start Romans chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. It says this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. So he says, very rarely are you going to die for a righteous person. Righteous meaning morally upright. Uh, but he says, possibly, possibly you might die for a good person. Someone who's done probably more good than you in their life. They've done a lot of good things, and you're like, ah, maybe I'll die for them. Paul's trying to set the stage here. He's trying to help us understand how we are as humans. That based on, if you're in a situation where there's the possibility of death, and it's you and somebody else, you're probably going to save yourself. He's saying that, like, if it's a, if it's a morally upright person, you're probably not going to save them over you. You're probably not going to die for them. If it's a good person, like they've done more good works than you, maybe you'll die for them, but probably not. He's just setting the stage. He's helping us understand that, that when you think about human beings, even the, the kindest person, even the, the, the person you say, man, this is the greatest, this is, this is the kindest or the greatest or the, the, the best person that I know, you probably won't die for them. That's just human nature. I was watching a, um, a documentary the other day on uh, Deepwater Horizon. It was an oil rig that um, uh, had a blowout and then an explosion in 2010, killed 11 people. It was such a, a huge explosion. They said that you could see the fireball from 40 miles away. This was massive, a massive deal. They made a movie out of it and stuff like that. Um, and they were doing this, this documentary and they were interviewing some of the, the survivors and this one guy, he was retelling his story and, and, and kind of hit the survival that, that he had to go through. And he was talking about how when he kind of came to, um, he thought, man, i got to start crawling to what he thought was the outside. And as he's crawling there, he's crawling over bodies. And he said, these people, they weren't dead. They were actually crying out for him, asking for help. And he was going, but I wasn't in a place to help them. I really couldn't help them. I had no means to help them. And it was like he was trying to justify not helping these other people. And I thought, man, you don't have to justify it. It's human nature. Human nature says that if it's me versus you, I'm taking me. Like that's the reality. God's just setting the stage for what he's about to say. Look at verse 8. Verse 8 says, but, but God. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. But God. I love that start. Because like he's saying, hey, human nature is this, but God. You probably wouldn't die for somebody else, but God. You may have been treated this way, or this might be your experience, but God. But God's very different. Why? Because God did something totally different. He, in fact, he gives us three components. I love studying scripture, and when I do, I try to break it up to understanding like the different components and what God's trying to teach and what the author's trying to, to share with us as the reader. And there's three components in this passage that are crucial for our understanding and for understanding what God has for us today. The first one is this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Other translations say, but God shows his love for us in this. Now, I think it's fascinating that the word that's used here is demonstrates or shows. It wasn't demonstrated. It's not God showed us. So it's not a past tense. 
It's a present tense. Like, like God did this and God's still doing this. God is still demonstrating today. What is he demonstrating? He's demonstrating his love for us. Have you ever questioned God's love for you? Have you ever wondered if God actually cares for you? If you're a human, you probably have. There's probably been something in your life, some moment, some season where you were walking through it and you're going, God, do you love me? God, do you see me? Do you care about me? And most of us have walked through that. And why? Because it's sometimes hard to see God's love being demonstrated to us. Because God's love is very different, uh, and how he demonstrates it is very different than how you and I demonstrate our love for one another. Right? When you and I demonstrate our love for one another, it's usually kind of along the same, same means, right? Like this past week, we just had Valentine's Day. Right? And so to demonstrate love, people gave flowers or gifts or, or chocolates or maybe a nice date or something like that. That's how you demonstrated your love during that day. Or like if you love someone and you want to you get married to them, you do something called a proposal. Right? It's one way to show love. In fact, I found a proposal this week that it just grabbed my heart. I thought, I want to show our church this proposal. So take a look at this guy demonstrating his love. That poor guy, <laughs> he put himself out there. Some of you are like, oh, why'd you show that? I just had to. Uh, it just made me laugh this week. That's, that's one of the ways we demonstrate our love to others, right? And, and, but God's way of demonstrating is very different. It's very different. In fact, the word that's used there for demonstrates uh, is the Greek word uh, uh, sun isteme. And sun isteme literally means that, that God is going to show or display or to teach by comparing and combining two things. So God is demonstrating his love by combining of two things. What is he combining? Well, let's continue on in the passage. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners. So the first thing he's combining here to show us how he loves us is this idea, this truth that while we're still sinners. Paul makes it very clear that God didn't come for those who are already righteous. It wasn't like God's looking at it going, oh, man, there's two groups of people here. There's the righteous people, the good people. They don't need me. There's these other group of people, and they do need me. God's looking at all of us going, you all need me because you're all sinners, every one of us. And then Paul makes it very clear, what is sin and why, why are we sinners? And in, in, in Romans chapter 1 and 2, he talks about what that looks like, that, that it's those with a depraved mind. It's those who have replaced the knowledge of God with lies. It's, it's those who have replaced the worship of the creator for worship of the creation of money and possessions and each other and all of those things. And so all of us can look at that and go, okay, I can identify with some of those things. Last week, we looked at the definition of sin and how sin is simply this. It's missing the mark. What's the mark? The mark is perfection. Like that's the standard that God sets for us, and none of us are perfect. So we can all say, okay, we're sinners. Well, God's saying, I've demonstrated my love for you in this, that while you were still sinners. I didn't demonstrate my love for you once you got your act together. I didn't demonstrate my love for you once you, you cleaned up and, and you got rid of certain sins in your life and, and, and you came to a certain knowledge about me and anything like that. Like, God's not saying, I demonstrated my love for you once you stopped worrying and you stopped having fears and doubts and questions and all of that. God said, while you were still sinners, I died for you. This is how he demonstrates his love for you and I, is that while we were still sinners, now, if I'm God, I, I'm probably not choosing this path. It's a good thing I'm not God. But one of the reasons is because I probably wouldn't choose. I would probably say, hey, if you want to receive my love, first straighten up. I get your act together. Because I don't want to, like, just be pouring out my love and you're not returning it to me. Like, so get your act together. Clean up. Do good with your life. Show me that you can change. And then I'll show you my love. But we don't actually do this with those closest in our lives. Like, if you have kids, it's not how you, you treat your kids. And my daughter and I, she's 10 years old. We were riding in the car the other day, and she said, Dad, what would you do if I, if I denied our faith? 
I said, I would deny you. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Y'all were like, oh, dang, you mean. No, immediately. When she said immediately, I said, baby girl, I would love you no matter what. Because that's what we do as parents. Now, there are times our kids do things that we don't like what they do. And there's times our kids are acting certain ways that we probably don't like them. Can I get an amen from any parent in the room? Right? There's those times where you're like, man, I don't like what you're doing, or I don't like who you're becoming, or what, but I still love you. I still love you. A friend of mine taught me that years ago, that in discipline and whatnot, like, there's a lot of times where I, I would go, hey, I love you, but you da 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 And he's like, just change that. Like, tell him what, hey, this is what you did wrong, here's your consequences, but I love you. Because as parents, we want our kids to know they are deeply loved, no matter what decisions they make in life. Our God's love for us is even greater. It's even more dynamic than our love for even our kids. So God's saying, I'm demonstrating my love for you. I'm demonstrating my love for you on a daily basis by combining these two things. This one is this truth that while you were still sinners, and then let's finish the verse and see the second thing, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we're still sinners, what's the second thing? Christ died for us. Christ died for us. So the two things that God's combining here to say, hey, I want you to know that you know that you know that I love you. So I want you to know first that while you were still sinners, while you were not deserving of grace, while you were not deserving of God's love, Christ died for you. Christ died for you in the midst of your junk, in the midst of your pain. It doesn't matter how messy your past was or is. It doesn't matter how complicated you think your sin is or how bad of things that you think you've done or the beliefs that you held or the beliefs that you're currently holding. God says, I've died for you. And this is the greatest news ever. I mean, this is the news that everyone in the Old Testament was looking forward to. This is the news that the the, the, the Israelites, when they were trapped in slavery in Egypt, that they were longing for this greater day. When they would see the love of God demonstrated in such a way. This is the news they were longing for when they were wandering in the desert. And eventually they get to the promised land. And when they get to the promised land, they become comfortable. And they've got kings. And they're living in a land that they call flowing with milk and honey, meaning it's paradise. They've got everything they could possibly want. And yet they long for this greater day. It's the same longing that people in first century Judaism were longing for. They were longing for this this release from captivity, not just from the Romans, but release from captivity from their sin. It's what we've always longed for in our lives. It's what 16-year-old Ernest was longing for. When I'm looking at, at trying to find happiness and joy and I'm doing all the things the world tells me to do and you'll be happy, and I wasn't. And I wasn't fulfilled. The great news is that while I was still a sinner, while you were still a sinner, God loved you so much that he sent Christ to die for you. And the whole reason we're doing this series, I mean, this series, when we, when we planned it, I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be the hardest thing to preach because it's literally the same message every week. If you're like, Ernest, you already told us that we're sinners and that God saved us. Yep. And you're going to get two more weeks of it, okay? (laughs) So I'm processing through. I'm like, God, okay, we believe you're telling us to do this. Why? One, there's people who walk into this place every single week. Every single week. People who are watching online every single week. Like somebody's been praying for you. For some of you, I know your name. For some of you, I don't know your name. For some of you, we've had very direct conversations. You've been very honest with me. I'm so honored that you would. And you've said, hey, man, I'm not there yet. Like, I, I don't know if I believe in this Jesus guy. I don't know if I'm, if I'm there to receive that and all of that. And I just I appreciate that honesty. Somebody's been praying for you. Begging God on your behalf. There's a spouse, a grandmama, an auntie who's just been praying. That you would receive this truth. That you would recognize that you're a sinner in all of us. That's easy to recognize then you would see what our great God has done for us, 
We talked last week about how our sins, it, it does a few things. And one of the things it does is it kills. It kills our relationships with others. It, it, it sometimes it can kind of destroy our mental state. It can kill us physically. But the most important thing it does is it kills us spiritually. It kills our relationship with God. It separates us from God. Like that's what our sin does. God doesn't walk away from us. We turn on him. And yet God loved you and I so much that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And it's receiving that receiving what Christ has done on the cross for us. And so some of you, that's your your next step today. For others of you, you're a follower of Jesus. And my hope during this series is twofold. One, that you would invite somebody. There's somebody in your life that doesn't know Jesus. Because of your invitation, their eternity can be transformed. Because if you simply inviting them over the next couple weeks and they hear the gospel message, their eternities can change. All because of an invitation. Then I also, my prayer is that you and I would grasp the depth of God's love for us every day. And like It wouldn't be like I made this decision a long time ago, and here we are. It's like every day I'm like, holy cow. God, thank you for your incredible grace to me. I mean, I think that's hard to do sometimes. I think it's hard, like, on a daily basis to be reminded of, like, I'm a sinner. And God's great grace provided a way. Like for me, I, I, I'm a professional Christian. Like I'm a pastor. Like I get paid to like help others and care for others and lead others to Jesus. So it could be real easy to get so fixated on all the other things I've got to do today as a professional Christian. Forget that I'm human. And I'm a sinner in need of God's great grace. So my prayer is that you and I, maybe it's a recalling of like where you were when you gave your life to Christ for the first time. Maybe it's just simply looking at where your life's been over the last year or last month, maybe the last couple days, and you can see the hand of God on you. My prayer is that you would just take time. Like, God, thank you. Thank you that you would love me enough to demonstrate that love by combining these two powerful truths. One, yet while I was still a sinner, while I was undeserving of God's grace and far from him because of my own sin, Christ died for me. God loved me enough to send his only son to die on the cross so that I could be forgiven and have new life with him. So if you haven't received that today, we give you an opportunity here in a moment. We said six more people last service give their lives over to Christ. And I know there's some in here. God's going, I want you to come home. I mean, if you're already a believer, man, may become fresh today. May like your, your love for him be renewed today. May your understanding of what he's done for you be fresh come alive in a different way today. May you give him thanks. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and I thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you that these passages are saying the same thing over and over, just in a unique way every time, to just remind us, to teach us, to demonstrate your great love for us. And God, first, I want to say thank you. Thank you, God, for rescuing this messed up kid. Feeling like I had nowhere else to go, God. And you rescued me. God, I thank you that every day You give me grace. Every day you forgive me. 
Every day your mercies are new. Thank you, God. Father, for some of us, we came into this place. And some of us are people I've been praying for for a while. Some of us have been had people behind the scenes, our moms, or love, another loved one that has been praying for us. We'd finally turn our life over to you, God. And today is a day. So if that's you and you admit, hey, man, I came into this place just feeling far from the Lord, disconnected from him, not being able to feel his presence, hear his voice, any of that. Maybe you've never received Christ. Maybe you did a long time ago, but you've been doing your own thing. You realize that, man, it's just not working. Yes, I'm a sinner. I'm not perfect. I just can't do it on my own. God's saying to you to come home. What does that mean? It means receiving what Jesus has done on the cross for you. And I'm going to ask you here in a minute, if that's you, I just want you to raise a hand. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. Anything like that, I'm just going to ask you to raise a hand so I can identify you and pray for you. So if that's you, if you came in here feeling far from the Lord, feeling distant from him, you want to receive Christ or maybe make a recommitment to Christ today, I just want you to raise a hand. Amen. 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 Father, thank you so much for each one of these individuals. If you're watching at home, you can simply text the word follow to the number on the screen. And if you made that decision, I just want to say, man, God is rejoicing. God is rejoicing. In fact, the Bible says that when one sinner repents, when one sinner turns, when one sinner comes home, the angels are rejoicing. And so we rejoice with you now in this moment. It's the greatest decision you could ever make. It's not always the easiest. But as a church, we'll walk with you. And more importantly, our Lord will be walking with you. He sees you. He knows you by name. Welcome home. Father, for all of us, tell us what our next step is. God, for those of us who already know you, have made that commitment to you, I pray, Father, not only would we have a profound gratitude for your grace and your great love and how you've demonstrated that love for us. And yet while we're still sinners, you died for us. But I pray we would share it. It would be a responsibility we would own and we would share it with others in our lives. Whether it's by inviting them to church or sharing our story or just praying for them, that God, we would own it. And we would share your great grace that we've received with others so that the rest of the world will know so the rest of the world will have a chance to be transformed through your mighty power and your grace that is at work within us. Father, tell us what to do now in Jesus' name.